So we've now talked about the concept of a multi-class classifier. And now it's time to put a, a little bit of uh, code uh, to this concept. We're going to start by working with the SGD classifier and, and we'll work through several different examples. The first example, we're going to construct three different classes from that same action variable that we've been focusing on uh, to date. Uh, we're going to distinguish uh, assistive movements by the robot that are forward and triggered by a gestural uh, movement of the baby. That, so that's one class. The next class are left and right um, movement periods that are also triggered by gesture. And we're going to distinguish those two from all other classes. So power steering is, is in this all other case and backwards gesture is, is also in this other case. We'll work on constructing a model, examining uh, the predictions that it makes, as well as the confusion matrix and, and also the class probabilities that it spits out. Some of the nice visualization tools that we uh, got used to in the last set of examples are not so easy to come by now that we have more than two classes, uh, but at least we can get some intuition as to how well our classifier is doing. The second example, we're going to use that same uh, pr classification problem, but we're actually going to take a cross-validation approach uh, so that we can convince ourselves that we're actually learning something that's uh, useful. And then finally, we're going to throw a different classifier at the same problem. Uh, in this case, I'm pulling uh, out the random forest classifier. This is the one that your book talks about as well. We're not going to talk about what's inside this classifier right now. This will be a, a topic uh, for a little bit later in the semester. So let's turn to some code. The first thing that we're doing is constructing the class labels that we need uh, in order to build our model. And this variable here is going to take on those class labels. Before we talk about what's going on inside of here, uh, let's talk about what uh, C0, C1, and C2 correspond to. Um, these are our classes 0, 1, and 2. And what they're assigned to is the list of action types that correspond to that class. So C1 corresponds to action type 5, which is the gesture triggered forward movement. C2 contains 7 and 8, which are gesture triggered left and right movements. And C0 contains the remaining integers. For the list comprehension, notice that we're looping over all of the uh, actions uh, in the data set. And the element that gets uh, inserted into the list for a given action A can be one of three different values, 0, 1, or 2. It's 0 if the action is in C0, so in Python code. This is asking a question of membership within a set. So if the action is within uh, this list of numbers, then the value that we're going to end up with in our list is zero. Otherwise, we're going to get a one if A is a member of C1, so the forward gesture movement. Otherwise, we're going to insert a, a two. So let's execute that. And then in this bit of code that I've already typed in, uh, this looks, this should look very familiar to you. Uh, I'm constructing a set of standard in, inputs and outputs. Uh, we're still using the position and velocity uh, data as input. And then we're using the label type that we've just constructed as our output. Uh, and then uh, we're using our SGD classifier and fitting that classifier to our inputs and outputs. So let me execute that. And that should be relatively happy. OK, so let's, let's pull out, now that we've learned a model, let's pull out uh, the set of predictions. And I also want to know what the class probabilities are that are being assigned 
uh, to uh, each of the classes for each of the uh, inputs. And we can ask that uh, using the predict prob a method for the classifier in Z. Okay, so, so now we've passed the, our inputs back into our model and asked what it's uh, predicting. Let's go ahead and look at some of the output. Time is already defined for us uh, elsewhere. It helps if I spell figure size correctly. There we go. The important takeaway from this picture is that uh, we should be predicting a value of either zero, which you see most of, most of the time that, that our model is predicting this, uh, a value of one, so we see a few of those, and then the remainder are uh, twos. Let's go ahead and look at uh, the confusion matrix. So we're, the parameters that we're giving to the confusion matrix are the ground truth outputs and the predicted outputs by the model. And we'll just look at that matrix. So the way to read this matrix is that uh, the rows are ground truth, the columns are the predictions that are made by the model. Row zero corresponds to that class zero, so the, the catch-all class. Row one corresponds to uh, the forward gesture movement, and row two corresponds to the left-right gesture movement. Uh, and again, that's ground truth. Uh, the column, for, column zero here corresponds to the model making a prediction uh, that we have the catch-all class, class zero. Mid, the middle column is, uh, is a forward movement prediction, and the uh, rightmost column is the left-right uh, pr class prediction. A couple of things to notice here. Uh, first off, the, the ground truth uh, contains more zeros than it does uh, ones and twos. So that's, that's why this row has so many more items than the remaining rows. The other thing to, to look at is that at least within this lower right hand uh, side, most of the mass is along the diagonal. And, and that is a, a good thing. There, we're only confusing left, right, and forward uh, a, a little bit. Um, however, there are lots of scenarios where the ground truth says forward or left, right, and the model is actually assigning a, uh, a class zero uh, label. And this is not an uncommon type of uh, situation to be in when we have uh, an imbalance in the number of classes, cl uh, class instances. Uh, okay, so. So that's, that's our confusion matrix. Let's also look at our, the probabilities. And first off, uh, let's look at the shape of that. Um, so for each one of our samples, so rows are samples, we have three different values and those correspond to our three different classes, zero, one, uh, and two respectively. Okay, here's the code for plotting each of the three probabilities, so we're extracting each of the, the columns, uh, zero, one, and two, uh, and we're going to color those are red, green, and blue, and then I'm also going to plot the predicted value that we were looking at just a second ago. I'm doing a little bit of scaling and shifting to get it out of the way, so it's not covering up the, the probability plot. So let's look at that. So, so there's a lot going on uh, here. Uh, 
what you'll see is that most of the time the red curve sits above the blue and the green curves. And, and that's why we have the, uh, the label of zero uh, for most of this range of time. And, and as you saw in practice, having non-zero values are, is actually pretty uh, rare uh, for this particular predictor. In this region here, the green line exceeds the value of the red line. And it's during that period of time where the model is assigning a, a class one uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the output, which corresponds to the forward gesture. And, and then within this region here, we, we have sort of a mix of uh, green and blue going above red very briefly. And, and that's why we, we're seeing this mix of uh, class two and class one. Now in situations where we do have in the training set far more class zeros than we have the other classes, we might actually, in an implementation situation, we might actually make different choices about how to translate these probabilities into a class output. In this case, the default behavior of the SGD classifier is just to take the highest probability class. But we could say that uh, green above 0.25 is sufficient for it to win over red, or, or the same for blue. We're, we're not going to pursue this particular uh, approach right now, but that's certainly a possibility. And, and it's actually something that we do in the Baby assistive robotics work. Okay, next I'd like to show you the cross validation approach to this. So we're actually looking at that confusion matrix we were staring at, and these probabilities all correspond to uh, data that the model was actually trained on. And, uh, and as we talked about before, it's very important to not really dwell on how the models perform on the training data, but to actually look at independent data. So there is a, a function that's uh, nicely available to us uh, called crossval predict. And it performs that cross validation step for us. So I'm going to do 20 fold cross validation as we did uh, in one of the previous videos. And then we can compute a confusion matrix. And print that confusion matrix out. And there we go. You'll notice, sorry, if we flip back up here, we had a reasonable distinction between the two gesture-based movements here. Um, by the time we actually do proper cross-validation, that distinction, if we squint a little bit, is, is there, but it's not so clear anymore. We've, we've had more mass shift onto this, the, the diagonal elements here, uh, and we've we've had more mass shift over to here as well. So, so what this is indicative of is our model is actually overfitting the training set data some. And, and in a larger scenario, this is something that we really uh, need to be addressing. But for the instant, I'd, I'd like to actually turn to uh, a different uh, problem. What I'd like to do next is uh, do prediction not based on three classes, but uh, a, a total of nine different classes. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. Okay, our next problem is uh, to actually look at all nine classes uh, as independent entities rather than trying to collapse them into a smaller number of classes. Uh, so the inputs to the next model are going to be the same as we've always had, but now we're just adopting this action variable. So here's our classifier. It's the same as, uh, as we've constructed uh, to date. And we're going to go ahead and do the, the cross-val predict uh, 
uh, directly. Um, this particular function we haven't talked a whole lot about, but, uh, but what it actually does is it takes as input some sort of a, of a classifier and uh, actually it takes as input, a, uh, it can either be a classifier or it can be a regression model and it automatically chops up the, the training data set or the, the input data set into uh, some number of folds. Here I'm specifying 20 and then it goes about constructing uh, a, a separate training set uh, for each of the 20 models that it's actually going to build uh, and then it does the, uh, the testing on the remaining data set. And this PRED6 is uh, the, the predictions that are made on the individual elements that are being used in, as uh, test data and not as training data. So let's go ahead and execute that and look at the confusion matrix that we end up with. So here are the results. Um, one thing that you'll notice is that there, although I talked about having nine classes, there are actually uh, only eight rows and columns here. And that turns out to be the case uh, because we do not have any examples in our data set of a forward motion that is triggered for power steering. So the rows then are uh, correspond to no robot movement, we skip left. Uh, next row is uh, corresponds to uh, left. Uh, sorry, this is this is backwards, left, right, and then we go on to the gestures: forward, left. Uh, sorry, sorry, forward, backward, left, and right. Uh, what you'll notice here is that. Um, at least there's some mass along the diagonal. Uh, as we had before, there's still a lot of cases where the motion is actually happening, but our uh, classifier is still uh, predicting uh, no motion. And, and again, this is par for the course, given that we're uh, using a, an algorithm selected uh, threshold, we could choose our own uh, to do things a little bit differently. Um, but this is also useful uh, from the perspective of analyzing the kinds of errors that the model is making. So uh, for this particular uh, column here, uh, of, of the, the, the cases where we have a forward gesture, uh, 41 of them are being classified correctly by the model. However, uh, some are being confused with left and right uh, gesture, and a whole bunch of them are being confused uh, as being no movement. The other thing that sort of catches my eye is this 47 sitting up here. This is a case where the ground truth is no movement, and yet our model is labeling uh, this as a forward gesture movement. So at at this stage, we're not going to talk about formally uh, testing uh, these confusion matrices, uh, but this is something that we'll get to in, in not too long. Uh, eyeballing this, uh, it seems to me that the classifier is learning uh, something, but it's not terribly clear that the distribution is different from one, is very different from one row to another. So, so this, tells us that the, the model is not necessarily learning uh, quality information. We'll, we'll talk a bit about that here in a moment. Um, before we finish up, I, I wanted to show you one other uh, example here. I'm going to switch, I'm going to scroll back to where we started this review of the code and, uh, and uh, give you uh, a slightly different perspective here. So, so instead of using the SGD classifier, I'd like to demonstrate using uh, the random forest classifier. We won't talk about what's hiding inside, but, uh, but fundamentally it's a decision tree algorithm where we're not building just one tree, but a whole bunch of different trees. Uh, 
I'm doing this switch right here. And what's kind of cool about the way the scikit-learn API is defined, uh, we, we don't actually have to change anything else uh, downstream. So I can execute this code uh, as, as before. Ah, except I have to make sure that I am importing this classifier. So let's do that. I had failed to include this import up at the top of the skeleton that I gave you. Here's the correct uh, import. We're pulling in from sklearn ensemble and we'll, we're pulling in that particular class. So now this should execute fine. And uh, everything else, as I said, that we do is actually, uh, it doesn't require any changing. We're still referring to a, a, a classifier and this classifier adheres to the same API as the previous classifier. So we'll execute this, get a new plot here. Uh, th so this is the, uh, the plot of predicted action as a function of time. You'll notice that there's a lot more uh, non-zero predictions that, that are being given. So pull up the confusion matrix. And one thing to notice here is that we have a lot more mass uh, down the diagonal here than we uh, had before. Before we had a lot of mass sitting down the left-hand column here. Um, so our model is actually doing quite a bit better, at least uh, on the training data. And again, this is a, uh, a problem moving forward. Before we fix that though, let's uh, go ahead and look at uh, the probabilities that are being generated. and this sort of matches our intuition about the model doing better with the data and that when it, we actually transition uh, from one uh, action to another, um, it's being very clear uh, in, in that transition in, in terms of the probability. So as soon as we switch over to green, which corresponds to a label of one, uh, it flips to a very high probability and then it flips back down. Okay, so now let's go ahead and do the cross-validation. Uh, this classifier five is still our random forest classifier. And we'll go ahead and execute that. And this might take a moment, so we'll edit out some time. Okay, so here's our confusion matrix. Now that we're actually uh, dealing with independent data for our testing, things are quite a bit uh, messier than, than they were before. All of that nice mass that was sitting down our diagonal, uh, a lot of that has uh, <clears throat> leaked to the left-hand column or to the top row here. Uh, and, and this is an indication that our decision tree uh, forest uh, model is actually dramatically overfitting our data since we went from a very clean looking confusion matrix to one that's not so clear. We'll, we'll talk more about decision trees and the kinds of parameters that you have available, but, but there are ways for us to actually control that overfitting process. Very quickly, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the nine class case. So that's going, it's uh, executing. Um, something is changing in the API that uh, I, the code ought to adapt to, uh, but it hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, become a problem quite yet. And uh, so, so we're getting a whole bunch of future warnings here. Okay. So now, now we can compute that confusion matrix and, and print it out. Uh, in this particular case, I just, I did the cross validation right off the bat. Uh, and uh, looking at this confusion matrix, it's nice that we can actually visually see that diagonal. And, and there's a fair amount of weight along that diagonal. Um, but still we have, of course, lots of weight down the left-hand side. And there are lots of cases where we're misclassifying uh, a movement uh, as, as no movement. So that's what's happening uh, along the, uh, the top row here. Uh, 
Okay, so that, that's a very quick example of multi-class models um, being used. So before we close out this uh, video, I'd like to make a couple of notes about the data that we've been working with here. Um, first off, we're actually using a very tiny amount of data. We have a total of five minutes of data from a single infant, and we're trying to build some pretty complicated uh, classifier models uh, around this data set. In, in practice, when we're actually doing this work, we actually make use of uh, data derived from something on the order of 10 to 20 infants. And we actually have uh, uh, something on the order of 10 to 12 five minute sessions for each one of those infants. So we have an, another order of magnitude of, of data uh, to uh, work with in, uh, in our typical case. The other point I want to make is that our labeling process actually leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, so we're labeling uh, uh, each of our movement periods. I have it listed as, as positive here, um, but uh, for a forward movement, that entire movement is being labeled as forward, say, gesture. Uh, but the reality is that uh, if we look just one sample before that gestural movement was initiated, the positions and velocities of all of the points on the body are actually very similar to uh, the positions and velocities uh, on, at the sample that the movement is actually started. And, and in fact, position does not evolve very much over those first few samples uh, during movement. So, so in some sense, we have a bit of a noisy uh, labeling process happening here. Uh, the, because we're, we're labeling some very salient uh, uh, cases as either positive or negative, depending upon where they fall uh, relative to the, uh, that initiation point. In practice, what we, we, what we tend to do is censor some of the, the data so that we don't have these ambiguous labels. Um, so, so what we'll tend to do is uh, at the point that movement is initiated, we'll take the first second or so of data just prior to that and remove that from the data set for, uh, the, uh, for the purposes of actually constructing these models. One other point is that we haven't talked about statistics yet, and, and this is going to be important as we uh, move forward in measuring properly the uh, performance of our learned models. Uh, a, a typical approach when we're dealing with these confusion matrices is, uh, is to use a chi-squared test. And uh, when we do this, we actually uh, make a comparison uh, between the different rows in our table. Uh, and our null hypothesis is that uh, the model does not uh, generate different distributions of outputs as a function of the true classes of the input. And, and what this means in the confusion matrix is that uh, each row, the distribution of points uh, of, of the samples doesn't change. We saw a few examples uh, in our code where we were sort of eyeballing things and seeing changes uh, from one row to the next, uh, where we were seeing a lot of mass down the diagonal. We we're also seeing some cases where it was harder to see uh, distinctions between the different rows. And, and this chi-squared test is one way for us to formally uh, test whether or not our model is learning anything interesting. So this concludes this uh, set of examples for, uh, for our classifiers. And we're ready to talk about uh, a couple of bigger issues uh, before we're done with uh, classifiers.